I, I, I shared the last two times on Wednesday night that I, I was here about prayer and being prepared by prayer for what God wants in the future. And uh, today I, I said, you know, I think we're just going to pray tonight, but, but the Lord just started speaking some things to me. So I'm going to just share with you what I've got. And I'm, I'm going to read out of uh, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, out of the Amplified Bible. And I want you to listen to this. It says, I sought a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I found none. I want you to listen to me. God's seeking for people that'll stand in the gap. God's seeking people who will take time to pray and intercede and stand in the gap. And I, I really believe that if we will make up our minds as believers to pray, I don't mean talk about prayer. I don't mean throw up a little prayer every once in a while. I'm talking about get serious about prayer. I can't make you do it, but it can be caught. I believe you can be stirred up to pray. Amen. We can make a difference. Let me read you another scripture here that'll help you with this because here's the thing. There are so many needs. If you're not careful, it could be overwhelming. How many of you know that? I mean, really, if you, get, if you start just thinking about all the things that need to change or need help or need this or need that, it could be overwhelming. But, but you don't have to pray for everything, but you need to be praying for something. Amen. Amen. There needs to be something that you're grabbing hold of in your life uh, to pray about. And the thing I found out is the more you do that, the more you'll be trusted to pray about other things. Galatians 4.19, I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation because I love the way it says it. Paul was writing to the church of Galatia, and he said, You are my dear children, but I agonize in spiritual labor pains once again until the anointed one will be fully formed in your hearts. He was talking to people that he had a passion for and he desired to see God work in their lives. But at this point, this particular group were trying to go back into Judaism and trying to operate under the law and be under grace at the same time, which is impossible. It's an oxymoron. You can't do it. There's no way you can do it. You can't be under the law and under grace at the same time. You can't think that all the good stuff you do is your way and call it grace. It doesn't work that way. Amen. So Paul had such a burden for these people that he said, and I like it says in the New King James, in the King James, I travail until Christ be birthed into you again. In other words, you're slipping away. You're slipping back. You're moving away from what you ought to do. And so I'm going to pray and I'm going to travail. That means it was coming out of his inner <clears throat> inner being and cry out for you that Christ, the anointed one, will be fully formed in your heart. You know, sometimes I think we just kind of, somebody gets saved and, you know, and we just put them out on the freeway and say, you're on your own. Or somebody falls or somebody makes a mistake or somebody sins and we say, well, that's it. No, wait a minute. Now, hold on a second. Paul said, I'm going to travail again, again. That means he'd already done it once. I'm going to pray again for them that Christ would be formed in them. That that spiritual birth that they had will come alive again on the inside of them. And I'll tell you, I think sometimes we just give up too easy. When God really wants to use us in somebody's life, that we can see God do something for them and, and change them and in a sense, resurrect them again. So Paul was adamant about this. Well, God's looking for people like that that'll stand in the gap. 
When you see somebody, and I dare say everybody in this room knows somebody like that. I've got somebody particularly on my heart, actually a couple of people that I've been praying for that, that, that have had an impact in the kingdom of God. And now they've gotten away from that because of sin. Listen to me. And, and my heart is to, to, to cry out for them and to pray for them and, and, and so that God can work in their lives. And I'm going to deal with this some more later, so I don't want to get into detail. But the point is, Paul, again, everybody say again, travailed over them, prayed over them. Amen? And didn't, and didn't quit, didn't give up on them. Everybody still with me? So I want to encourage you in that area. Let me just use this example to you over in Genesis chapter 18. And I'm not going to read all of this, but, but I, I, there are some things I want to read out of this. Um, uh, there were some angels that came and, and ministered um, to Abraham and to Sarah. Okay, And they were about to leave in verse 16, and they looked towards Sodom, the Word of God says, in verse 16, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And listen to what it says in verse 17. And the Lord, y'all still with me? The Lord, everybody say the Lord, said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Hey, those angels were on assignment. They were on their way to nuke Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, shall I hide this from Abraham, what I'm doing, since Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed for him. For I know him, and, and um, I'm going to just say, I know his family, and I know he's going to do right. I know he's going to live right and do what he's supposed to. But verse 20 says, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is grave, I will go down now and see whether they've done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I'll know it. How many of you know what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, there was a lot going on. A lot going on. Homosexuality was rampant. And, and, and there were other things, and I don't want to get into that because I don't want to waste my time talking about it. Okay, but it, 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 Sodom and Gomorrah has always been identified with the ugliest of the filthiest of the filthiest. Okay, so, so listen to me. And so... Listen to what it says. It says there was an outcry. An outcry. Where did that come from? It wasn't the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. There were righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, but not many. Where did that come from? It came from the earth itself. You don't think that things are, are, are being, there's not an outcry in our nation or, or in the world for that matter over what's happening, grooming kids to be homosexuals, trying to get them to change their identity because they do something silly and think they're a boy when they're a girl or a girl when they're a boy. And they don't even know, you know, what they want to watch on TV, whether they want to watch Bluey or they want to watch <laughs> Mickey, Mouse. Mickey Mouse or something. And yet we're saying it's okay to mutilate your genitals where you'll never be the same again. You don't think that kind of stuff goes up before God? You're mistaken. Okay, it, it does. All right, it, it does. And so Abraham came, to, came near and said this. Listen to this. He stood in the gap. In verse 23, he said, Would also you destroy the righteous with the wicked? People say, well, you know, it's the wrath of God's coming on America. Wait a minute, I'm the righteous. God's not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Amen. Especially if we're doing our job. Y'all still with me? Yeah. All right, so just stick with me. Uh, and, uh, he, and, and Abraham started dickering with him. Suppose there were 50 righteous. 
within the city. Would you destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that are in there? So if you've got a few righteous in the midst of a wicked city, hey, you can still get something accomplished. God can still do something and do something big. Amen. And he, he goes on to say, uh, far be it from you to uh, the judge of all the earth not to do right. How would you like to talk to God like that? Don't think I will. Okay, now listen to this. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous in the city, I'll spare the place for their sake. So Abraham said, well, if you'll do it for that, um, what if it was just 45 just 45. So the Lord said, okay, I won't do it for five. Uh, well, 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 let's talk about this a bit. What about 40? Then he went down to 30. How about 20? How about 10? For Abraham's sake, for the righteous sake, he would have, he would have listened to me, he would have spared those cities for the righteous sake. Because Abraham was righteous. Same way you and I are, I are because he believed because of faith. Go read it in Romans chapter four. Okay. So he stood in the gap. He stood in the gap. Now, I'm sure Abraham was convinced there's no way there are not 10 people in that city that are righteous. There's got to be 10 people in there. And he quit at 10. Now, I'm going to show you this. That's, don't quit. I, I, think, I think if Abraham had gotten down to the point of saying, listen, I'm righteous and I'm asking you for them because I'm righteous, God would have said, okay. Because he stood in the gap. Instead of it always being such a negative about people and about their lives and how bad they are, how bad they become. And listen, you, there are certain times when you have to separate yourself from people. I'm not talking about spending your time with them. I'm talking about prayer. I mean, I had a, a good friend many years ago, and I think I've shared this before, but a good friend, and he got into sin. I kept trying to help him, kept trying to help him. Finally, one day, the Lord spoke to me and said, if you keep this up, you're going to be tainted by his sin. So I had to back off. I didn't quit praying for him, but I backed off. So you've got to understand, we're talking about prayer here. And in the midst, listen, in the midst of this, think about this for a minute. Abraham stood in the gap down to 10. Sometimes I think, listen, I think we quit right before we could get a breakthrough in somebody's life because we think, I've done a, I don't know what else to do. Well, you can always pray. You can always cry out to God for somebody, for their life. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to change their will. I'm going to show you this in a minute. Doesn't mean you're going to change their will, but at least, listen to me, and we don't know that what Paul did was as effective as what he wanted it to be. But the point is that he stood in the gap. Abraham stood in the gap. There's an account here, and I'm not going to read all this either, but in 2 Kings chapter 13, Elisha was about to die. And so Joash, the king of Israel, came to him and said, uh, uh, he called him his father, and he said, the chariots, uh, uh, they're, they're about to come upon us. They're about to descend upon us. And we're going to die. What can you do? And Elisha said, take a bow and some arrows. So he took them and he took them and, and uh, he, put it in, uh, he put it in the king's hand. And, um, and he, he, Elisha put it in his hands and he said this. He said, open the east window. And he opened the window and Elisha said, shoot. So he shot an arrow out the window. And the, and the prophet called it the arrow of God's deliverance. All right. One arrow. That's it. One error. Y'all still here? Okay. So error of the Lord's difference. De uh, deliverance. For you must strike the Syrians um, and you have to destroy them. Then he said, take some more arrows. And he took them and he said, take them and strike the ground. And so he struck them three times and stopped. He, three times and stopped. 
Okay, now that, this may not make sense to you, but it will, hopefully you'll get this. So when he did that and he stopped, the prophet got mad and said, you should have kept on striking those arrows five or six times. Then you would have struck Israel till you had destroyed it. But now you'll only strike Israel three times. And, <laughs> and he died. What's the point? The point is, he could have kept on striking those arrows and more deliverance would have come, but he quit at three. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't quit praying. Let God's deliverance come. And, and, and again, sometimes what happens is that, that uh, God's deliverance will come to a degree, and you quit striking. You quit standing again. Well, look, God's done something. Yeah, but that's not the fullness of it, is it? Well, I don't think so. Well, then don't quit praying. Well, my kids, uh, I've been praying and praying, and my, my, my child finally, they got delivered from drugs. Praise God they're delivered. They're delivered from drugs. Yeah, but you better keep striking the ground. Because number one, temptation is going to come back. Number two, I want more. I want more for you, for kids, than just to be delivered from drugs. I want them to be filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in the power of God, walking in the Word of God, being a man or woman of God. That takes more than one or two arrows. So don't quit. Stand in the gap. Stay with it. Same thing happened with Moses. God got upset with the children of God. He was going to burn them, just kill them. I guess that in my, my view, that's the maddest I could ever read of God. God was willing to kill a whole nation. He got so mad. And raise up Moses in a, new, a, a, new, a, a whole new nation. And he could have done it. <laughs> How many of you know that? All right, but, but listen. He said in verse 10 of Exodus 32, my wrath may burn hot against them that I may consume them and I will make of you, Moses, a great nation. And Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Now notice this. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 14. Listen to this. So the Lord relented. Because he stood in the gap. So he stood. So he prayed. I like what it says in Psalm 106, 23. It says, therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, you're his chosen one too, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest he destroy them. We've got a place of power and potential in prayer. Listen to me that if you'll just not quit. And, and listen, I'm, I understand that you've been praying for so-and-so for so long and nothing's happened. Well, why are you quitting? Are you saying God's not going to do anything? Oh, no, God can do it. God can do it. Then keep standing in the gap. Just keep standing in the gap. If you'll do that, you'd be amazed at what can happen what God will do, what God wants to do. Let me show you another scripture that'll help you with this. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. <clears throat> now this may, um, this may shake up your theology a little bit. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that you should pray about that. So he's talking about prayer. 
All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Let me read this out of the Passion. If anyone observes a fellow believer habitually sinning in a way that doesn't lead to death, you should keep interceding in your prayer that God will give that person life. Now there is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not encouraging you to pray for those who commit that. So, so you hear what the Spirit of God's saying here? Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. Well, but what if it's that sin uh, that, that leads to death? Listen. Don't be the judge. Unless somebody is obviously turned over to a reprobate mind and they hate God, they're against God, they have walked away from God. I mean, I, I don't want to paint you a picture because I've seen people like that come back. But the point is, don't be the judge of that. Don't get yourself over there trying to decide, well, is it, are they worthy of me praying for them? Have they sinned too bad that it's, uh, they're not worthy of my prayers? Are you kidding me? A lot of people do stuff just out of stupidity and ignorance. You know, I've told you this story before. My friend, Happy Caldwell, you know, he got saved. He was selling, selling uh, liquor, and he sold liquor to me at the restaurant I was running in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he had, he had just gotten saved, and I saw him every, all the time buying liquor from him. Never said a word to me about Jesus. So when I got saved and we kind of connected and realized this, the, 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 the deal, and I asked him, I said, how come you didn't tell me about Jesus? He said, you were so bad, I didn't think you would listen. And you know what my answer was? You could have saved me two years of heartache. Or three almost. Three, two or three years of heartache but maybe I wouldn't have received. But see, you can't, live, you can't have that kind of attitude. You're praying. It's not like you're going and running, running the, the streets with them. You're praying. You, and so you've got to understand and, and realize that if, uh, if you're praying, then you need to be ready to let God work. Really, this prayer, I believe, from my studies, is a prayer for spiritually weak believers who need God's grace in their life. You know, there are a lot of people like that. There are a lot. There, I would probably tell you the majority of the body of Christ falls in that area. And, and, and they need someone just to pray for them. It, it, they don't need people preaching to them. They need people praying for them. And you can't pray for everybody, but you can pray for somebody. You, they, they can have that. The, the, now, the, one of the things you need to understand about this, this isn't talking about the world. This is talking about Christians. It's talking about brothers. You got it? It's talking about believers. If anyone sees his brother sinning. Now, I know you can stretch that out to talk about, well, who is your brother? But, but bottom line, that's talking about Christians. Okay? So when you understand that, it's people who've had a relationship with Jesus. They're not like deliberately defying God and rejecting the truth and abandoning their relationship with God. They're just struggling. Up, down, in, out. You know anybody like that? Yeah, well, they need prayer. They need you to pray for them. Well, I just don't understand why they get They're supposed to be Christians, and they're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing this. And then I see them, and they come to church, and they're worshiping God. They're hypocrites. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe they're just weak. Maybe your prayers could turn the tide where they would fall on their face before God and, and, and the power of God would totally transform them, change them, put them, move them in a different direction in their lives. 
God's looking for people to stand in the gap. And that, that's who, we're, that's who we're, we're after. Because listen, there are a lot of people who hadn't conquered the power of the, of the enemy in their lives, even though they're Christians. Some people don't want to, but who are you to judge that? Who do you to judge what's happening to them in their night seasons when they're by themselves and they're crying out to God because they're, they can't break through instead of standing in the gap for them? Aren't you glad you came to church on Wednesday night? So there are believers who are struggling and the church is responsible to pray. And what are they doing? They're giving them life which is a renewal of spiritual strength in their lives. You know, it's interesting that the Lord wouldn't have told us to do this if he wouldn't, wasn't going to be willing to do something in their lives. So I want to encourage, and, and listen, I've seen fruit of this in my own, in my own prayer life. I've seen people get strong. I've seen people who were weak that were, uh, were, were struggling in their lives. And I've seen all of a sudden that something changes in them. Well, I believe it's because somebody, and I'm not bragging on me because I'm sure I wasn't the only one, stood in the gap for them. I mean, I think we need to pray for people that aren't saved as well. Don't misunderstand me. But, but you know, my, I, I just, I, I kind of go back to my dad sometimes with some of this, because my dad was an alcoholic most of his life. As long as I was around, he drank a lot. But he got saved. I prayed for him, and he got saved. He, you can ask Becky, he truly got saved. He was a different person after that, a different person after that. But you know what? He still smoked. He didn't like it, but he still smoked. I'm not sure he probably didn't drink a, a, a beer every once in a while. Well, most of the Christian world thinks that's okay today anyway. So but I wouldn't want you around my dad saying it was okay. When he's, that's a battle he's had. But the point is, there were areas of his life where he struggled, even though he was a Christian, because he was a baby. And, and, and tr just praying for him to... And travailing that in, in him, he wasn't like he was out there sinning, but yet there were struggles in his life. So, so I, I prayed for him until he went to heaven B because of that. You think about the prodigal son. It's interesting that, that the father didn't go after him. He just stood there and waited on him. And I'm sure he was waiting, not just wondering he was waiting doing whatever he knew to do to bring his son home and his son finally got in the hog slop and he came home so we've got to be careful how we understand this and 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 how we how we um process is, if, if you want to say it that way, to understand the impact and the power that you can have in somebody else's life to stand in the gap for them. I, I'm standing in the gap for a number of people. A number of people. And I, look, I'm, I, please don't read that like I'm bragging. I just want you to understand that, that, that that's part of prayer life. Is praying for other people. I don't pray for them every time I pray, but a lot of times I'll be praying. And all of a sudden, one of them will pop up in my mind, and I'll just I'll just take off praying for them. I believe it's making a difference. I've seen it make a difference in some. Some I hadn't seen anything yet, but that doesn't mean God's not working. Doesn't mean God's not working. So you've got to hang in there and 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 pray. But but. Listen to what the, the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because this is even, this stretches you out even further. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. Well, I don't know how you do that. 
naturally. Lord bless the world, I don't know. But, but pick, pick one. That, that's mankind there. That's not talking about men or women. Okay. Um, for kings, all those who are in authority, all those who are in authority, whether they've got a D by their name or an R by their name, all those in authority, y'all still with me? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. I, I get, I, listen to me, I get s scared in a sense, fearful in a way, not like terror, but concerned about a lot of Christians in our nation and how they're putting all their marbles in our nation instead of in God. And they're calling it their trust in God, but they're expecting God to do something with our nation. And God says, wait a minute, I got another plan. You pray for whoever's in authority that you might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Amen. Now, see, I think sometimes <laughs> we, we read this wrong. We read this like if I pray, then the government's gonna do what it takes for us to have a peaceable life in our nation. But that's not what that means at all. It means that if you pray, you will lead a quiet and peaceable life. And let the results belong to God. Listen, I want our nation to be great. I want us to be the fountainhead of the gospel to the world. I don't want that to ever change. But I tell you, right now, we're not in a good place. But if that's what you're looking toward and that's your focus, your, your focus is wrong. Your focus is wrong. Does that mean we don't pray? Oh, no, we pray. Do you vote? Vote, yeah. But listen to me. We, we, we've got to pray. That's our role. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that Roe versus Wade was overturned because of prayer. But do you know what? It hadn't stopped abortions because the wicked are going to still do whatever the wicked are going to do. <clears throat> All it's done is hold it back. And we've got to do something, and we need to pray along those lines about, about children. You might want to go read what God, how how how. The, the heathen treated children and how they offered them for sacrifices and how they treated them. And that's what's happening in our country right now where school teachers can talk to kids about changing their identity and not ever tell their parents about it. That's ungodly. That's unholy. And so what's the answer? Well, your answer is to pray. I'm going to go to the school board meetings and I'm going to raise... Yeah, that's the problem. You're raising the wrong flag. <laughs> Doesn't mean you don't say, speak up. Nothing wrong with that. But listen to me. You need to be praying. <clears throat> that's what the Word of God says. And, and, and people say, listen, I don't know what to pray. I got good news for you. It doesn't matter. Because there's one who dwells on the inside of you who knows how to pray for you if you'll let him. Romans chapter eight, verse 26. Listen to what it says. The spirit helps us in our weaknesses. When we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, the spirit himself makes intercession for us. Somehow people think that's the Holy Spirit before God. That's the Holy Spirit in you. And those groanings are not his groanings. Those groanings are your groanings which cannot be uttered. That word there where it talks about cannot be uttered, it literally means to be uttered in articulate speech. You, can't, you don't have the language for it. But the Holy Spirit has the language for it. 
When my, listen to me, when my spirit prays, I'm praying in other tongues, my spirit prays and the Holy Spirit takes hold together with me against that inability to pray to accomplish what God's plan and God's will is. It is one of the greatest tools we have. And I want to tell you something. Listen, religion doesn't like it. And the world doesn't like it. And so they try to make you a mockery. They don't want you talking about it. They, they, they make it foolish. But it's not. It's power. It's your power. My power, your capability, my capability, because the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. When you pray in other tongues, your spirit prays. It's the greatest asset you have to your ability to pray is praying in other tongues. Well, but I try and I get bored. Listen, you hadn't clicked over yet. I, I remember when I first started praying in the Spirit, I'd get bored because your mind's not engaged. How many of you know, you ever notice that? Your mind's not engaged. So, so all of a sudden, you're thinking about what you got to do tomorrow and all, the, all this other stuff. And the devil's telling you, well, you know what? Somebody's knocking at the door. Well, the phone's ringing. Well, you better stop. You got to do this. You know you got to do tomorrow. You better make a plan. I mean, all kinds of stuff can run through your head. But if you'll press in, listen to me, and get a taste one time of the Holy Spirit kicking in, you'll never, ever want to do it any other way. Because he, cook, he, he, he hooks up with you, and it is amazing where you go from there. And prayer is always going to be a discipline. It's always going to be a discipline. Because your flesh doesn't want to pray. So it's going to be a discipline. It's got to be something you say, no, no. No, I'm going to do this. That's why in the Old Testament, the Lord, he had hours of prayer. He had times where people had to pray. Because there was discipline there. I'm not telling you when to pray, and I'm not telling you how long to pray. But I, I can tell you this, the more you pray, and the more you get hooked up with it, the more you're going to see God work. You're, it's just amazing what you can see. He's looking for people to stand in the gap. You going to be one of them? You're willing to do that? You're willing to take time out of your schedule and say, I'm going to pray for so-and-so. They're struggling. They're not serving God. They're not living the way they should. I'm going to pray for them. You got to be. You got to understand. You got to know that God wants to use you. And I, I, I listen. Some of the testimonies I could tell you about prayer and and use, God using you to pray for people. I prayed. I've prayed for people that I didn't even know and saw in a vision, and then was, and saw them six weeks later. One time, it was a person in the Philippines. I knew him. I, 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 I saw him. Saw exactly what happened to him. I saw him bent over like this. It was a man. Saw him bent over like this. And then I saw him raise up like that and throw his hands up in the air. Six weeks later, I was in a meeting at the Araneta Coliseum in Manila, Philippines. And I heard somebody scream in the back, and it was that man. I saw his face, and I knew it was that man. To have the privilege, I'm, I'm, I probably wasn't the only one praying for him, but to have the privilege of being able to do that, are you kidding me? You can't compare that to anything that the world has. Can't, can't even compare anything the world has. Amen?